Psalm 131, a song of ascents of David. Lord, my heart is not proud. My eyes are not haughty. I do not get involved with things that are too great or too wondrous for me. Instead, I have calmed and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child with its mother, my soul is like a weaned child. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, both now and forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we come to learn from Psalm 131, let's spend some time praying. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and the chance to open it and read it together this morning and pray that by your spirit you may work in us to open our ears to hear what you have to say and please give us hearts to understand. Amen. So when I was living in Sydney, the most common answer to the question, how are you going today, was usually stressed, busy, or tired. Stressed, busy, or tired was the things that I heard most commonly from my friends and family and acquaintances when I was living in Sydney. And so the big thing was, how do you rest? How do you find rest? How do you rest? What do you do? Do you watch TV? Read a book? Have a nice cup of tea? Well, these are all good things to do to rest, particularly when you need a mental or a physical break. But the thing that Psalm 131 raises for us is, how do you find true rest? How do you find true contentment? The ability to quieten your soul and calm it during all the turbulent questions that rise up within you. Well, here in David's Song of Ascents, we get a picture of where David looked to for rest and where we can go as well. And so the first thing we learn about this psalm right in the title is that it's a song of ascents. What does that mean? Well, this is a song that the people of Israelite that the people of Israel would sing as they walked up the mountain towards Jerusalem and towards God's temple. This was a song they would sing to help refocus their minds after a long and excruciating journey to Jerusalem, to help them refocus on what they had come to do and get ready to meet with God in his temple. And then David uses this opportunity to help correct some of the negative attitudes that the Israelites might have been feeling that was putting distance between them and God. So in verse 1, he talks about pride. He says, my heart is not proud. When the Israelites come before God, David didn't want them to be proud. Pride is when we start demeaning other people because we don't think that they are worth anything. We think that we're better than them. Or we think that they're just not good enough to help us do anything. And David says that the people of God, as they come to meet with God, should have nothing to do with pride. Firstly, because it demeans the people who are created in God's image, just like us. But secondly, because it puts distance between us and God. Because as we start diminishing God and his knowledge, we start thinking, I could be a better God than God. And that, at the heart, is the true essence of sin. When we, in our pride, assume that God can't help us, that God doesn't know what he's doing. And so David says right out at verse 1 that this should have no place in the lives of people who are coming to meet with God. So David starts by saying we need to have the right view of other people. Then he moves on. And he speaks against arrogance. This is similar to pride, but instead of putting other people down, this is when we start lifting ourselves too high. I love the way David puts it in this psalm. I don't get involved with things that are too difficult for me. Now, before I went to Bible college, I was a history teacher by training. So how would it look if I left Narrabri, went to the CSIRO Cotton Research Facility, and started telling everyone who worked there that they were using the wrong fertilizer on their cotton. Well, it wouldn't look very good. 
I can't even keep a house plant alive for more than a week. What arrogance would it mean? Would I have to be able to think that I could tell anyone how to grow cotton? As far as I'm aware, cotton doesn't even use fertilizer. Who knows? And this is the kind of thing we see on the internet all the time. All you have to do is read any comment section and you see lots of people claiming to be experts in subjects that they know nothing about. And this, David says, is something that should not be a part of the people of God. This arrogance that lifts us up far beyond what we are capable of doing. The people of God need to be willing to say, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. How about we go and find out? You see, because things that are too difficult for me now don't always have to be too difficult for me. If I really wanted to go to the cotton research station, I could go back to school. I could go and get my degree in agricultural science focusing on cotton growing. And then suddenly those topics wouldn't be too difficult for me anymore. But until then... David wants me to have a right attitude towards my abilities and my own knowledge, particularly when it comes to the Bible. There are plenty of areas in the Bible where the answer is not always as clear as we'd like it to be. Sometimes we don't know the answer. And when we're talking to other people or ourselves, we need to be willing to admit, I don't know, and then use that I don't know as inspiration to go and find out the answer, to speak to other people, to find people who know more than us so that we can find the answer so that I don't know turns into a, actually, now I do know. But the other reason David says that arrogance should have no place in the people of God is because, yet again, the more we let our arrogance creep into our lives, we start to believe that we're too good for God, that we don't need him, that I could earn my way into God's salvation. I don't need Jesus. I'm too good for Jesus. I know exactly what I need to do to get into heaven. But nothing could be further from the truth. Paul, in his letter to the Romans, particularly in chapter 3, says this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We could never be too good for God. We could never earn our way into God's kingdom because the entry price is perfection. And none of us are perfect. But in Jesus, God has opened the way for us to come back to God. Not because we deserve it, not because we've earned it, but simply because he loves us. So David says, arrogance has no place. But what's the solution? How do we get rid of pride and arrogance? How do we find contentment and rest in God? Well, the starting point for thinking rightly about ourselves, others, and gods, David gives his answer in verse 3. Have a look at it with me. I have calmed and quietened myself like a little weaned child with its mother. David's answer is resting and trusting in God. You see, before a child is weaned, Whenever their mother holds them, all they can think about is food. They fret and they fuss and they they demand more food, more food. After Josiah and Vivian were born, the midwives would often say that if the child is too distressed when mum is holding them, hand them over to another family member. Give them to dad, grandma, auntie, uncle. Why? Because suddenly, when they're with someone else, they'll stop thinking about food, stop demanding what they don't need, and they'll be able to calm and quieten themselves. But then, as a child gets older, they start to trust. Mum knows what's good for me. Mum knows when I need food, and I'll get it when she knows I need it. I don't need to fret and fuss and demand. I can rest 
and just enjoy being with mum. And that's how David wants us to be with God. Not fretting and fussing and demanding all the things we think we need, but resting and trusting that God knows what we need and he will give us what we need when we need it. He will not always listen to our demands, but he will give us the comfort, the strength, and the faith that we need exactly when we need it. But how can God bring us this rest? How can God bring us this contentment? What right does he have? Well, David, he sings this song as God's chosen people, pointing people to God and showing them how they can rest in God. Well, a thousand years later, the true and better David comes along. Jesus comes and he sings this psalm every time he walks up to Jerusalem with his family and his household, reminding him that God will be with him, that God will give him what he needs, even through his toughest trials. And then he reflects on it again as he slowly walks up another hill, this time outside of Jerusalem, going to the cross. At the cross, Jesus could have been proud. He could have said, this is too shameful for me. You people aren't worth it. I'm not doing this. He could have been arrogant and said, I'm God the Son. I don't deserve to die. I'm not doing this. But he didn't. In his humility, he submitted himself to the will of God, trusted that God the Father knew exactly what he was doing and allowed himself to be killed on a Roman cross so that our sins could be atoned for, so that we could come to God as his beloved children. And then, three days after that event, God vindicated Jesus' trust in him by raising him from the dead by taking his humility and turning it into triumph so that now the way is open for all to come, to trust and to rest in God. God can bring us rest because we don't no longer need to search for truth, for meaning, for identity, community, all these things he has given to us when we're struggling for identity and need something to hold on to, God says, you are my child. When we're struggling for meaning and have no idea what the purpose of life is, God says, I created you for a reason, to love and trust me and to serve the church. When we're feeling isolated and alone and longing for community, God says, welcome to my church your new household that spans continents and ages. And when we're looking for hope and everything feels bleak, God says a new and better world is just around the corner. Trust me, it is coming and you will live with me forever. We can stop searching and rest and trust that God has our best interests at heart. And that even when things are hard, when we're struggling through difficult times, God says, everything that happens is conforming you to the likeness of the Son and preparing you to live forever with me in heaven. This is why Jesus can say in our reading from Matthew, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. All of you, take up my yoke and learn from me, because I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for yourselves. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. His burden is light because we do not need to save ourselves. We do not need to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and make ourselves good enough for God. 
because he has already done that for us. His yoke is easy because we don't need to have an answer for everything that's going on in the world, every problem that we have, but we can say, I don't know, and trust that God does and that he will give us that answer when we need it. This isn't always easy, this rest and trusting in God, particularly when things are difficult, when you think you're coming out of lockdown but it gets extended. But step by step, God is working in us by his spirit to help us day by day to find our rest in God, to ask the questions of him that we need to ask and then wait patiently for the answers. God doesn't expect us not to have questions, to not find things hard. And when we ask, he will give us the answers that we need. It just won't always be the answers that we demand. Pride and arrogance distort our view of ourselves and other people and ultimately of God. But God is willing to help us to become humble to help us to be like a child with its mother, resting in his arms, trusting that he knows what's going on, he knows what we need, and he'll give us what we need when we need it. During these times, he will see us through. Maybe it will come in the form of a comforting Bible verse that you read just at the right time. A walk with a friend during our time, a lot of time of exercise. A phone call with a family member. A helpful session with a counsellor or psychologist. God is working in us. He will give us the strength we need to get through these trials. And he does say, these trials are preparing you to live with me in heaven. We can trust that even when things look bleak, He knows what's going on. He knows what we need. We can be like a child, trusting him. And that is how God will bring us contentment, even when everything is turning upside down and sideways every other day. It can be tempting to think that God has abandoned us. But he hasn't. He's helping us to rest in him. Even when it gets hard, he says to us, I am strong enough to get you through this. Trust in me. And when things get too much, when you don't feel like you're coping, pray to God, call out to him. Let him hear you, let him know. He will hear you and he will answer. And like a mother with its child, he will give you what you need when you need it. He just don't, won't always give us everything we demand, but he will give us what we need so that we can see this time through and we can come out the other side praising God for his goodness and his glory. Put your hope in the Lord both now and forever because he will not fail you. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we ask that you will help us to trust you, particularly in these difficult times. Help us to see that you are providing everything we need and help us to come out the other side praising you for your amazing works during these difficult times. Amen.